All right. Well, I think um, we might be just about ready to start. It looks like there are people still streaming in, but um, I want to welcome everyone to um, Grand Rounds uh, today for the um, Semmel Institute. And um, I'm wanting, um, I'm really excited about um, you know, our um, speaker today. Um, the speaker is Stephen um, Freed, who I, we actually have Peter Weibra to thank for Stephen um, giving the talk today, um, which um, he and um, Peter Weibra um, um, have been in conversation, I think, for a while at Penn, um, since Peter had been at Penn prior to coming here. Um, what is kind of very cool about um, Stephen giving a grand rounds today is, and I think it's a real treat for us, is I don't think we've had a speaker who has um, written on such a wide range of topics um, looking, yeah, and, and it kind of makes sense, looking just at his Wikipedia page, for example, he's described as an investigative journalist, nonfiction author, essay, essayist, and adjunct professor. And he's an adjunct professor both at Penn um, as well as at Columbia in the School of Medicine um, in the Narrative Medicine um, I, um, Department. I think it's department or program. Um, and just to give a sense of what he, you know, the kind of range of works that he's, um, and these are just books that he's written since he's in, written uh, an, an, huge uh, innumer innumerable um, articles as well. Um, but just to give a list of, I, I think this I don't, probably isn't even complete. Um, so in 1993, he wrote A Thing of Beauty, The Tragedy of Supermodel Gia. Um, and then in 1998, he wrote Bitter Pills, Inside the Hazardous World of Illegal Drugs. Um, and then in 2002, he wrote The New Rabbi by Bantam Books. And then um, in 2007, he wrote um, Husbandry, which was a collection of essays on marriage and men. And um, then he's also written, um, let's see, another book on Fred Harvey and the business of civilizing the Wild West, One Meal at a Time. And, and that was, um, came out in 2010. Um, and in 2015, he co author or um, I think he uh, co-authored a New York Times bestseller, which um, got um, was widely re um, reviewed and positively reviewed as well. Common Struggle, a personal journey through the past and future of mental illness and addiction. Um, and then his what he's here today for, which is really a sense of well, like a really fascinating talk, is uh, his recent book, most recent book, which was published in 2018. Um, and titled Rush, Revolution, Madness, and Benjamin Rush, the visionary doctor who became a founding father. And the book's been really well received and has um, gotten a number of awards. He, he was a finalist for the 2019 George Washington Book Prize and then the 2019 American Library Association Notable Book List. Um, and no doubt, as um, you know, the title of Stefan's talk, um, suggests he'll be telling us about Benjamin Rush and why we should know something about Benjamin Rush, especially a psychiatrist. I was telling um, him, it's stuff, it's even earlier to, um, uh, um, that I, even though I'm a historian of psychiatry, I know precious little about Benjamin Rush, and it is sort of a um, unfortunate um, truth of, I think, of American historians of psychiatry certainly have ignored Benjamin Rush. So I think Stephen's um, new book is um, really important um, and will give us a sense of why Benjamin Rush is so important. Anyway, so his title of his talk today is Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin Rush, What the Founding Father of American Brain Health Can Teach Us About the Past and Present. So um, with that, um, I'd like to give um, Stephen, a big welcome, and I look forward to hearing his talk. Um, after his talk, I just want to add that then um, he um, will have some time for question and answers. And you can see in that, I think there's a, um, a Q&A box that you can put your questions and answers. Um, please forgive me. This is the first time I've actually run this. So if I mess up, 
you'll know why. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Braslow. Thank you very much uh, to the Semmel Institute for inviting me and for Peter, uh, who I've been talking about for about uh, for a couple years. And um, you may have heard that there's been a lot of people uh, interested in Benjamin Rush after almost 200 years of nobody paying attention to him at all. And uh, some of it is because of this book that I recently published that I spent uh, years of my life on. Benjamin Rush is somebody you don't know much about. I'm going to start broadly. Um, in 1786, uh, Benjamin Rush described the challenge of America as seeking perfection in science, religion, liberty, and good government. Um, and this is as true today as it was then. It keeps getting truer. Um, he said that in, in the speech, which was now known as the first time that uh, somebody openly talked about mental illness and addiction as being medical problems and not just problems of uh, lack of faith or lack of will. And uh, this speech is, is one that was very controversial at the time. Sadly, um, we still have to convince people of this today. Uh, Rush uh, started getting people's attention during COVID. I thought it was interesting. Uh, one day on Twitter, I found this tweet uh, from Steve Stack, a uh, former president of the AMA, uh, who was quoting lines uh, of Rush's from my book uh, to inspire people who were on the front lines of COVID because of course, Dr. Rush was on the front lines of the first American pandemic. He posted this page. This is what Rush actually wrote in his letter home to his wife during the height of COVID saying, remember my dear creature, the difference between the law and the gospel, the former only commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves, but the latter bids us to love them better than ourselves. And some of these quotes uh, from Rush have been useful to docs on the front lines um, because they need that kind of passion and uh, support to get through all this. Um, people ask me how I got interested in Rush in the first place. Uh, I've been covering mental health for almost 30 years, uh, and I always heard that Rush was the founding father of American psychiatry. Uh, but when you ask psychiatrists, including Dr. Braslow, uh, why he's the founding father, they kind of shrug and don't know. And uh, what I did know um, was that his picture was on the tote bag of the American Psychiatric Association uh, convention every year. And this is actually my uh, tote bag from the year it was in Philadelphia to celebrate its 150th anniversary. I generally don't write books based on tote bags, but this one turned out to be a pretty good idea. Um, when I started looking into Rush, I realized a number of things. Um, he hadn't been written about very much, and most of what had been written was pretty old school, pretty boring. You wouldn't read it on purpose, probably even if you had to. I also realized that his life, if covered properly, um, spanned not only the entire revolution uh, from its earliest days, but um, all the way through the War of 1812. And since Rush was younger than all the other founders, you get to hear the story from a really different perspective. Um, I also realized that Rush was not only considered the founding father of American medicine, uh, in mental health, he's not only the father of psychiatry, but also clinical psychology and addiction care, all of which he talked about quite specifically and differently during the time when he was describing the work that they were doing at Pennsylvania Hospital, America's first hospital. He was also a landmark teacher of American doctors at the first American medical school at Penn. And he trained the first 3,000 of them um, and wrote the core books and articles um, on American education uh, that existed for the next almost 100 years. Um, I could also see that a lot of parts of his story were suppressed. So the reason you don't know the story isn't just because uh, you know people like Alexander Hamilton have better publicists and uh, get musicals written about them, but in truth, Rush had been so close to many of the other founders and they had been so open to him because he was kind of their therapist as well as their friend that when he died, especially Adams and Jefferson did everything they could to make sure all the in-depth correspondence they had involved Rush in was not seen by the public. Rush had also been keeping an autobiography for his kids, a sort of a burn book on everybody who signed the Declaration of Independence and all the generals in the Revolutionary War and the family was worried about that getting out too. So in fact, this material was suppressed uh, for over 100 years and only started leaking out in the middle of the 20th century. This is, if you don't know, this is what Benjamin Rush looked like. These are the two most famous portraits of him. The one on the right has been copied dozens of times. There's actually four copies of it within a few blocks of my house here in Philadelphia uh, because doctors who were trained by him wanted a copy of this picture after he died. But what I wanna focus on is the early Rush because again, parts of what's interesting about Rush is that he was so young as a founder and also a very precocious mind. This is what he looked like young. Uh, he had a big forehead, which people joked had so many ideas in it, they were always trying to burst out. Um, 
He was very brilliant. His father, his family was not well off. His father was a blacksmith, died when Rush was five. His mother was a working single mom who ran a shop on Market Street in Philadelphia down the block from Benjamin Franklin's printing press. Uh, but he was so brilliant as the oldest child that he was sent to a very highfalutin boarding school. And then at the age of 14 was sent to Princeton, what became Princeton, the College of New Jersey, as a junior, graduated at 15, and then um, went on to a medical career. Because his medical career was expensive, his family told him he could not marry until the age of 30. So we actually know not only about his young career, but all the women he dated and fell in love with um, before he was allowed to marry. And um, so uh, at this time, there was no medical school in, in, in America at all. You uh, were an apprentice to a doctor, and Rush was an apprentice to this doctor, John Redman. And then he was there when the first medical school started. So this is John Morgan, and this is uh, Dr. William Shippen, Jr. Uh, Dr. William Shippen came back from his studies in Edinburgh in the mid in the early 1760s and began the first class in anatomy in America. And Rush was a student in that first class, a uh, very controversial class. They were cutting cadavers live. And then Morgan, his friend, came back and started what became the College of Philadelphia Medical School, or later became the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. And instead of uh, saying that they were co-creating it, uh, Morgan said he created it himself. And because of that, Morgan and Shippen uh, hated each other for the rest of their lives. And Rush was caught with them being his mentors and sort of his tormentor because of their uh, problems. Uh, this would have been only an inside baseball thing in Philadelphia, except uh, if you know your revolutionary uh, medical history, you know that Morgan and then Shippen were hired to run the revolutionary army hospitals by George Washington, who was endlessly amazed at how mean doctors could be to each other uh, and how much they would argue rather than actually taking care of patients. These are early tickets. Um, from these lectures. At this time, you didn't pay tuition. You paid for individual lectures, and then at the end, you paid the doctor to give you a test, and that's how you pass the course. Um, Rush did this for several years, and then in 1766, um, he left America to go to, in, to go to Scotland to study at the University of Edinburgh, which was the top medical school in the world at that time, and where his mentors had studied as well. It was overseas in London where he first met Benjamin Franklin, um, who lived overseas during much of Rush's life. Franklin opened a lot of doors for Rush, introduced him to literary figures, to doctors uh, all over England and in France. And uh, Rush went to medical school, then lived in London, trained in London, then went to Paris, trained in Paris, and uh, returned to Philadelphia in 1769 to begin a medical practice. And he then became a professor at the um, College of Philadelphia Medical School. He taught the only subject that was open which was chemistry, and this is actually a ticket from one of his lectures. So it's very difficult to start a practice in Philadelphia at this time. Rush is, one of the reasons we love reading Rush is that he's, one, he's very funny. He's very open about his challenges. Talks a lot about how hard it is to be a young doctor, uh, especially a young Presbyterian doctor in a city that's mostly Quakers and people who belong to Church of England. He said that nobody would really um, give him patience. So he had to work with a lot of patients who couldn't pay him and paid him in chickens and did a lot of care in the poorer communities, which is why Rush knew everybody uh, and treated all different races, all different ethnic groups, and uh, was known for that, which is why there's so many Benjamin Rush awards today. Um, Rush aspired to being at Pennsylvania Hospital, which was the first hospital in America. This picture is actually what Pennsylvania Hospital looked like when Rush was young. There were farms around it. This is the front of it on 8th Street. It's still pretty much today. Um, Rush uh, worked with only poor patients for a number of years. Then he got frustrated and he decided that he would write a pamphlet, which is the new kind of communication, um, to try to troll for some better clients. Uh, he wrote this pamphlet called Sermons to Gentlemen Upon Temperance and Exercise, uh, which is the first self-help book uh, about how to exercise, how to take care of yourself, uh, how to eat properly. And um, one of the things he talked about was not drinking, but of course at this time, temperance didn't include wine and beer. Uh, wine was medicine, beer was not considered dangerous, only spirits. So in fact, this book about temperance uh, contains this wonderful uh, pay-in to wine. Uh, wine is principally useful to old people or such as are in the decline of life. At a medium, the body begins to decline at the age of 45 or 50. Then the hot fit of the fever of life begins to abate. And from the many disappointments in love, friendship, ambition, or trade, which most of men meet with by the time they arrive at this age, they generally feel a heavy heart. Here wine prolongs the strength and powers of nature, 
It is the grave of past misfortunes. In a word, it is another name for philosophy. Remember, my aged hearers, if you would expect to enjoy a long reprieve from the infirmities of age, you must begin to use wine moderately and increase the quantity of it as you descend into the valley of life. So we'd all like to have a doctor giving that kind of advice. Interestingly, one of the things that Rush wrote about in this book was that people had to exercise because too many of them had slaves who were doing their labor for them. And uh, by making this backhanded uh, comment, he attracted the interest of abolitionists at the time. And the top abolition of the, of the time, Anthony Benizé, suggested that he write a pamphlet on slavery. So Rush wrote a very powerful, controversial pamphlet, which was not only against slavery, became one of the first, if not the first founding father pamphlet against slavery, but he also wrote from the position as a physician against racial prejudice against African Americans who were free, which was at that time a separate issue and an interesting issue. He was very clear that African Americans were the same as white people. Uh, the only difference was their skin color and what had been done to them psychologically traumatizing uh, as slaves, uh, which was a very controversial point of view, which Rush held his entire life. Uh, because of this pamphlet and the aftermath of it, he lost almost half his practice overnight. Uh, we believe that's why he was not able, as he was building up his practice, to write Common Sense. Common Sense was originally a pamphlet that Rush had been working on. He decided it was too controversial, and he actually gave the project to a new friend he had met at a bookstore, Thomas Paine. Rush edited Common Sense, he gave it its title, and he arranged for it to be published. Uh, it came out on January 10th, 1776, um, which wasn't such a big day in uh, Benjamin Rush's life because it actually, something much more important happened to him that week. He got married the next day. So no one knew what, that what would happen with Common Sense would happen. Um, and Rush married Julia Stockton, who was the daughter of Richard Stockton, uh, the most powerful lawyer in New Jersey and whose family had donated the land for Princeton. Uh, his wife was Annis Boudinot Stockton, uh, one of the, the first uh, American-born female published author and poet. And uh, Julia was only 16. She was a very accomplished musician, but Rush was actually a bit of a feminist. Uh, he actually wrote to her, we have their love letters, and he wrote to her about the library he was building for her next to their bedroom and the first hundred books uh, which he had bought, and he listed them, uh, that he was putting in her library for them to talk about. And so uh, Rush and Julia were married at this time. Uh, at this point, Rush was not involved so much in the politics of the country. The doctors in town were, were uh, serving and, and, and doing medical services for the founding fathers, but not so involved. That changed that summer when John Dickinson, from the lawyer from Philadelphia, refused to sign the Declaration of Independence, and Rush was elected into his position. So he signed the Declaration only only weeks after he had joined the Continental Congress. And um, because of that, we have great descriptions of the declaration signing. He wrote about the incredibly dark, the fearful moment, because everybody believed they were signing their own death warrants, but he also uh, couldn't help but write down a few things that he found amusing. Uh, one scene he describes is um, uh, Benjamin Harrison, a very portly representative from Virginia, approaching with Eldridge Geary, who we now know for inventing gerrymandering, a very skinny guy from Massachusetts. And before they signed, uh, Harrison said, you know, when we are hung for signing this document, I'm going to die really fast because I'm a big fat guy and I'm just going to go. Pfft. And you are so skinny, you're going to dangle for a really long time. Um, so these are the kinds of things, these kind of observations that are in Rush's uh, commonplace books during these times which really captures so much of American history. Uh, it's at this time when he's in the Continental Congress that he becomes closer with Adams, closer with Jefferson. And he's already friendly with uh, George Washington, who he very much supports. He's head of the medical committee uh, in the Continental Congress. And in the fall of 1776, he wanders away from Congress so that he can be on the front lines with the troops. He's actually with Washington the night before Washington crosses the Delaware. And the scenes we have of Washington writing victory or death on little pieces of paper actually come from Russ's commonplace books. Washington's group goes over first. Rush crosses with the Pennsylvania uh, militia afterwards. He's there to take care of troops at the Battle of Trenton, and then he's there to take care of troops uh, at the Battle of Princeton, which takes place right in front of Nassau Hall, right in front of the building where he had gone to college. Uh, it's a terrible, gruesome battle um, where Rush first saw the horrors of war. His descriptions of the trauma he went through are uh, amazing, and uh, he's one of the first people to write about the trauma of war from a medical perspective. And if you look at the instruments that he uses on the battlefield, you can understand why it was traumatic. I mean, medical care at this time was mostly cutting things off um, and bloodletting. 
and a little bit of hot and cold compresses, some laudanum. And uh, these are the things they used to treat. Uh, Rush was traumatized by this. Uh, it was also traumatized because his father-in-law was kidnapped by the British during this time. And there was some question about whether he would make it back alive. Uh, after this, he wrote the first major treatise on medicine on the battlefield, which began with the famous line, fatal experience has taught the people of America the truth that a greater proportion of men perish of, with sickness in all armies than fall by the sword. And Rush was voted out of office at this time and became Surgeon General for the Middle Department, which meant that he was in charge of all the hospitals during, for the worst part of the war, which was taking place in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. He was at the Battle of Brandywine and many other battles where the Americans got their butts kicked. Uh, he was very depressed about what was going on in the war. This was the hardest time of the war. And he was devastated by this. He also was devastated that Washington wasn't putting enough money into the medical care. And his boss was his old uh, mean tormentor, William Shippen Jr., and they were fighting. So he was upset with Washington and worried about what was happening in the war. And there was really a chance that we were going to lose the war. So Rush wrote um, a letter. It's the kind of letter that you, sometimes you, you write an email and you know you shouldn't send it. And if you're smart, you leave it in drafts. Um, Rush unfortunately pushed send on this one. Uh, he wrote a letter to Patrick Henry, didn't sign it, but explained in it that he thought Washington maybe wasn't doing such a great job and that some of the generals that he was uh, using were really not the right generals. He was hearing this from other generals. Uh, Henry didn't know what to do about this letter. He didn't know who had written it. So he held on to it for two months. Rush wrote a similar letter to his wife, which I found in her stuff, which had never been published before. Uh, but what happened was Rush wrote to Washington. Washington finally came to agree with him on some of the medical issues um, about the, the service. But Rush uh, was forced out by Shippen out of his job, went back to Philadelphia. And only then did Patrick Henry take the letter that he had written and give it to Washington. And Washington um, knew full well who wrote it because he was friends with Rush and had lots of letters from him. And Washington never forgave Rush for this letter. Um, and it hung over Rush's relationship with Washington during his entire life and much of his afterlife. And part of the reason his family didn't want people to know about Rush's writing because they didn't want people to know that he'd been critical of Washington uh, because Washington was becoming so famous. So Rush started a whole new life. Um, he believed very strongly that the war was one thing, but that the aftermath of the war was the real revolution. And that's why some of his things that he wrote still uh, are so powerful to us today because the idea that America is an ongoing revolution is one that I think we still uh, very much need to embrace. And he believed very strongly that the first thing that needed to be done in order for people to be the kinds of citizens of a country that uh, rose to the level of what we had fought for was for them to be educated. He started Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, the first non-urban college in the country. He also started Franklin College in Lancaster, which became Franklin and Marshall, uh, which was started as a German speaking only college for German immigrants who could not speak English because that's what he believed um, should be done with immigrants um, somewhat different than leadership in our country today. And uh, he began expanding his own teaching at what became the University of Pennsylvania and he became part of the staff. This is the building, first building at Dickinson College and he became part of the staff of Pennsylvania Hospital. Uh, he also got involved in women's education. He believed that women should be educated the same as men and was involved in the first school for that. He also wrote the first major paper on public schools for states, which was for Pennsylvania, but ended up being used for many other states. And then he started doing medical writing as part of the staff of Pennsylvania Hospital. The first thing he noticed was he felt that about half the people in Pennsylvania Hospital, which remember was a free hospital only for the indigent, medical care was largely done at home, even operations. And a hospital was a volunteer thing for doctors, for people who could not afford medical care at home. Uh, he found that more than half the people in the hospital were there because of alcohol-related uh, illnesses. So he wrote this pamphlet, an inquiry into the effects of spirituous liquors on the human body, which became the cornerstone of the temperance movement. And then two years later, uh, he wrote this paper that he delivered at the American Philosophical Society, which is the cornerstone paper of our idea of, of mental illness and addiction as medical problems to be treated medically. Uh, it was called an inquiry into the influence of physical causes upon the moral faculty. And um, in it, he talked very clearly about uh, the fact that, I mean, this is a time when medicine was trying to separate itself from religion. It had been way too uh, involved with religion. And so this was one of the most important places that Rush could do this. Um, this lecture was uh, the comeback lecture of the Philosophical Society after the war. Franklin was sitting there in the front row it was very controversial, the ideas in it. 
Uh, sadly, I think we still um, talk about these issues today. Uh, but he was talking about how there could be physical causes for aberrant behavior um, that previously had been thought of as sinful. Um, and it was very controversial and very interesting. Um, and it also took in his experiences in war and talked about the psychological trauma of slavery. This is a time when there was much more uh, medical organizations being started to treat the poor. Rush was involved in the uh, creation of the Philadelphia Dispensary, which was the nation's first free walk-in medical clinic. Um, he also got involved in prison reform. Uh, his ideas about prison reform uh, were very, very influential, not so much during his life, but after. And he and Franklin also reinvigorated what had been the first American abolition society, uh, which was restarted in Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. To do this, Rush had to free, Rush actually, for some reason, we have no idea why, but in the late 1770s, Rush bought one enslaved person, a cook from a ship named William Grubber. We know very little about this gentleman, uh, except that Rush bought him. He appears in some of his journals and uh, the manumission papers were signed on May 24th, 1788. He continued to have a relationship with Grubber for, through Grubber's life. Uh, we found Grubber's medical records at Pennsylvania Hospital after he was freed, Rush was still paying for his medical care. Uh, it's a very curious part of Rush's story, uh, one that makes his story a little bit confusing, but Rush was uh, not you know, always a straightforward guy. He was a controversial guy. This was happening during the writing of the Constitution. Rush was not on the committee to write the Constitution, but he led the Pennsylvania delegation to approve the Constitution, and Pennsylvania was the last major state to do that. Um, he was mostly involved in fighting for separation of church and state, which was very important to him, even though he was a very committed Christian. He believed more strongly that religious freedom was incredibly important. Uh, he had Jewish patients. He had Muslim patients. He had patients of all different groups of, of Christianity. He was very afraid that America uh, would see itself as a Christian nation, even though he thought the teaching of Christianity and morality is very important. Um, so uh, he also realized that, his, that John Morgan and the others before him uh, did not write very much and weren't going to be remembered. So when John Morgan died and Rush took over his job as the leading doctor in Philadelphia, he began publishing medical books. Uh, he published a series of medical books uh, with all the same titles, Medical Inquiries and Observations by Benjamin Rush. There were four different volumes of this. It, it, it just grew and grew over time, but it was the first medical book in America and the first medical, American medical book that was sold overseas. At the same time, Rush was very active in doing the very first rounds of mental health advocacy, which looks no different than our advocacy today. Rush wrote a public letter to the managers of the hospital in, in 1789. Keep in mind at this time, people believed that people with mental illness couldn't tell the difference between hot and cold, so you didn't need to heat their cells. They were locked in the basement of the hospital. Uh, they slept on straw, and people could pay to come and see them and jeer them. It's one of the ways the people, uh, the hospital made money. Rush fought against all those things, forced the hospital to buy heaters, uh, forced them to stop letting people come and observe them, and uh, wrote this, patients afflicted by madness should be the first objects of the care of a physician. Many of them might be relieved by the use of remedies which have lately been discovered to be effectual in their disorder. So the first thing that Rush did that was big was that he just said, these are medical disorders. We should try whatever treatments we have on them, uh, which was very controversial at the time. And um, so some of those treatments we wouldn't use today, but the idea of using the medical treatments to see if they would work on mental illness was one of his initial innovations. Uh, as this was happening, Rush rose, and um, then Philadelphia became the center of America, became the US capital. So he became this very powerful guy uh, referred to as the American Hippocrates, uh, which is some combination of surgeon general and god of medicine, uh, which his, uh, pra the people who praised him called him that, and the people who sneered at him, caused him that, called him that too. One of the people who sneered at him was this guy, Alexander Hamilton, who I know you all like the show, but we don't like him in Rushland. He and Rush didn't get along at all, they disagreed on everything, even though they were neighbors. In fact, they lived around the corner from each other. This uh, census in the early 1990s shows Dr. Benjamin Rush's house being bought by uh, Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury. So Hamilton and Rush didn't get along, but Rush's wife and Hamilton's wife were friends. Rush's children and Hamilton's children were friends. And this all was happening as the capital came to Philadelphia, and Philadelphia became a center of media, a hugely important city in the country, more important than New York, more important than any other city in the country. 
Uh, this is also when the, the different colleges in Pennsylvania came together to create Penn. This is in 1791. And, and Penn wa and Rush was sort of the powerful um, uh, intellectual mind of the university, not just a doctor, but somebody who wrote philosophically, medically, uh, very important things that were read in Europe. And then um, in the middle of all this came the 1793 yellow fever epidemic, uh, which I could give a whole talk on, but I won't. Um, and uh, Rush was both the hero and the anti-hero of this. He was one of the few doctors who stayed in town. Uh, his treatments were very aggressive, heroic. Uh, we now know they didn't do anything. Uh, in fact, we now know that all the treatments that people did for yellow fever during this time didn't know it do anything. They had no idea what caused yellow fever or how to prevent it. And um, it's part of the reason that it was such a catastrophe. 10% uh, of the population of Philadelphia, 5,000 people, uh, died um, uh, within three months. And luckily, it ended when the mosquitoes died. It, in the absence of science, everything being, became political. Hamilton announced that he had been cured by a doctor other than Rush. And his cure was then known as the Federalist Cure. And Rush's cure is the Republican Cure, because Rush was more of a Republican. Uh, this is a painting that was done much later by a pharmaceutical company representing what Rush might have looked like at the time. And uh, Rush also, as, as is well known, worked with African-American clergy members uh, because the doctors had all left town and they acted as nurses and did treatments that he explained to them how to do. Uh, fascinating uh, situation, uh, which led ultimately to there being three books about yellow fever that came out right after the yellow fever epidemic. A journalistic one, one by Rush, and then one by these two um, uh, black clergy members, uh, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen wrote their own book about what it was like taking care of people during the yellow people fever epidemic and all the prejudice against them. Part of the reason that they knew Rush is because Rush was helping them build the first free black churches. And in fact, that summer, they both opened. Um, they both still exist. The one's actually down the street from my house, uh, Mother Bethel AME Church. And Benjamin Rush was an investor in these churches, helped draw up the plans for how they would be done, and was very active in abolition work and in work on behalf of free black people, because this time free black people were in being in re-enslaved in some cases. So the associations really had to give them legal help to prevent them from doing that. He also was very active in psychiatry. And this is the thing that, uh, especially people who are uh, French and British, who think that everything about mental health care was created by uh, Philippe Pinel and William Tooke don't like to hear. Um, one of the things that we found out by researching this is that while everybody knows paintings of Pinel uh, freeing slaves from freeing mental places from chains. Uh, most of the things that Pinnell started doing in France in the, 19, in the 1790s, Rush had been doing at Pennsylvania Hospital for almost 10 years. And um, what a lot of doctors who are interested in psychiatry don't know is that the, the West Wing of Pennsylvania Hospital on 9th Street is the first building built in America just for the moral care of people with mental illness. It was built in 1796. Uh, and this is well before uh, Pinnell and Tuke's uh, writings were well known. Um, it's not a competition. The three of these gentlemen had an incredibly important role in early psychiatry, but from, in most cases, hardly anybody knows Rush's involvement with this, whereas in fact, in many ways, uh, Rush was ahead of these two, um, even though there's no real indication they communicated all that much. Um, Rush spent a lot of this time in 1790 getting closer to Adams and Jefferson, who uh, were different politically, but he was close to both of them. And then he got caught in the middle of them in the 1800 election, which was the most contentious election maybe ever. And after it, um, Adams and Jefferson stopped speaking. Rush was caught in the middle. It was unbelievably politically divisive. There were some who wondered whether America was going to make it after that. Uh, and Rush wrote this to his sons. In battle, men kill without hating each other. In political contests, men hate without killing. But in that hatred, they commit murder every hour of their lives. Uh, from this point on, Rush was mostly a, a medical educator. He ran the University of Pennsylvania um, medical school. Every year he gave an introductory lecture to the course of, of uh, care for the year. These lectures were later put together um, in a collection. They're really actually very interesting. While a lot of the medicine obviously doesn't survive, the ideas about medical education survive, how hard it is to be a doctor and keep up with the literature. Uh, he wrote a paper on the diseases of domestic animals, which is really the beginning of veterinary medicine. Uh, he wrote about the duties of patients to their physicians, how hard it is to get patients to take their medication. He did have several innovations in mental health care, uh, which I think have been uh, overwritten about by the anti-psychiatry movement who really don't understand what they were. Uh, he also during this time came up with a plan for a separate uh, treatment for uh, addiction called Sober House, uh, 
uh, which pre, uh, predicted over 100 years early uh, what, uh, what our addiction care, especially uh, for alcohol, would be. Uh, he became the uh, medical advisor to the Lewis and Clark expedition. Lewis came to Philadelphia uh, to get advice for him on how to take care of themselves on the road. Rush gave them uh, pills that had mercury in them. You can follow mercury um, uh, on the road. So part of the way that we know where Lewis and Clark went uh, is because these pills, which were purgatives, uh, we know where they went. And that's how we actually follow Lewis and Clark across the country. Uh, so Rush stayed in touch with Jefferson, hadn't heard from Adams in five years. In 1805, Adams reached out to him and said, we should start talking before one of us dies. This began an epic letter writing campaign between the two of them, hundreds of letters over the next eight years, which really are a rewrite of American history. And um, their wives loved this because they were two old cranky guys uh, keeping each other company from long distance. Rush's wife noted that these letters were less with notice of, of founding fathers and more like two teenage girls writing about their college sweetheart, about their sweethearts. Um, family would sit around and listen to them read these letters. Um, one of the things that Adams was very worried about, as was Rush, that was that Washington would become too famous. They were worried that because there was no king, that fame would be more important uh, than the king had been. And so he, was, he wrote, uh, the history of our revolution will be one continued lie from one end to the other. The essence of the whole will be that Dr. Franklin's electrical rod smote the earth, outsprung General Washington, and that Franklin electrified him with his rod. And thenceforward, these two conducted all the policy negotiations, legislation, and war. So even then, they were afraid they wouldn't get the, their fair place in the story of America. One of the things that we find in Rush's letters to, to Adams is his discussions of mental illness. So Rush's oldest son, John, was a Navy physician, uh, and in um, 1807, he was in a duel with his best friend. They were having an argument over a quote in Shakespeare. He shot his best friend and killed him. And after that, John Rush lost his mind. This is actually the only image we have of John Rush. It's a, these are doodles from Rush's uh, date books on the, in the margins of them. And Ru John Rush became mad. Uh, his doctors in, in New Orleans, where he was stationed, tried to treat him uh, because they were former students of Rush's and they didn't want to admit to Rush. They didn't know what to do. They finally sent him home. And John Rush lived as a patient at Pennsylvania Hospital for the next 30 some years. This is his admission record. And um, this was crushing to Rush and, uh, and, and very much a setback to his uh, ideas of patient care. But so John Rush was the most famous mentally ill person in America. Rush did get two things done before he died. Um, he very much wanted Jefferson and Adams to be friends again because he believed that if the two of them, their friendship could be destroyed by partisan politics, what did that mean for the future of America? So he wrote them both endless letters to try to get them to re-establish friendship, which they did in early 1812. He then turned to his last writing assignment, which he wanted to write the first ever book on mental health care, uh, which he did uh, uh, only months before he died, Medical Inquiries and Observations Upon Diseases of the Mind. This is actually the copy you can see, which he signed to John Adams. Adams told him that this book someday would be seen as an incredible uh, contribution to medicine, but that Rush probably wouldn't live to see it accepted that way. He was right. Um, and Rush died in 1813 in April. This is uh, his grave. It's right uh, across from where Benjamin Franklin was buried. Um, after he died, uh, his wife, uh, who was crushed and very young, and, and his children tried to figure out what to do with his intellectual legacy because Adams and Jefferson didn't want the letters to come out and they were afraid for the autobiography to come out. So in fact, this material sat for a really long time. No one got to see it. In 1887, at the 100th anniversary of the College of Physicians, uh, this is when the AMA is first starting to come along, um, the head of the College of Physicians, uh, S. Weir Mitchell, a neuro famous neurologist, um, wrote for the first time saying that he couldn't believe that people still hadn't read Rush's stuff. And this was a really important man. We should be reading everything that he wrote. And just because he wrote some things about General Washington, that isn't a reason for us not to know Rush. At the same time, the American Medical Association decided that it would build the first statue of a doctor uh, in Washington, and that statue would be of Benjamin Rush. And so they started raising money for that. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association uh, took on Rush as their symbol. Um, actually, uh, S. Weir Mitchell became one of the first people to go into Rush's writing. He actually wrote a historical paper using some of Rush's notes from when he was in the Continental Congress. In 1804, the AMA gave this statue of Rush to Teddy Roosevelt. It's still in Washington. There's a copy of it in, uh, at Dickinson College. And in, 18, in 1905, uh, the heirs of Rush uh, published privately uh, a, an abridged version of his autobiography. 
uh, just for the family, 50 copies, all private. And none of this would have come out. You wouldn't know any of this. You wouldn't have to be listening to me doing a uh, grand rounds, uh, except in, 19, in the early 1940s, the last heir of this part of Russia's family, the Alexander Biddle family died and they auctioned off 900 pieces, um, letters from Rush, letters from Adams, letters from uh, Franklin Jefferson, uh, one of the most important auctions in the history of early American history, changed history. And uh, after that, um, the letters of Benjamin Rush were published uh, and uh, Rush's autobiography and his commonplace books were published. And that's where Rush scholarship died. And it was mostly take, uh, focused on politics, not on medicine. And the first person who paid attention to Russian medicine in a more modern time, unfortunately, was Thomas Saz. Thomas Saz used uh, Benjamin Rush as his whipping boy because he believed that Benjamin Rush had invented biological psychiatry, which, of course, in the 1960s, when Saz was writing, was what he thought was the worst possible thing in the world. Uh, so many people found out about Rush because of the very opinionated uh, secondary writings of Saz on Rush's legacy. Uh, more important but less well known are the writings of Eric Ted Carlson. Uh, who interestingly was a doctor in the Manhattan Project, later became a, a psychiatrist and a psychiatric historian at Weill Cornell. Uh, he wrote many papers about Rush. He edited Rush's Essays of the Mind. Uh, he put together a book of Rush's Lectures on the Mind. I actually found in his stuff a book that he wrote about Rush and medical philosophy, which is unpublished. And we can't find the footnotes. If somebody's looking for a great project about mental health in the early days of American medicine, this book is it. Um, and so the, people did not pay attention to his medical legacy that much, except people on the way to writing about other things. Rush knew this was going to happen. He wrote, the most acceptable men in practical society have been those who have never shocked their contemporaries by opposing popular or common opinions. Men of opposite characters, like objects placed too near the eye, are seldom seen distinctly by the age in which they live. They must content themselves with the prospect of being useful to the distant and more enlightened generations which are to follow them, which is you. Um, so uh, I think that Rush is an important character for us to look at, not only in terms of early American health, but I think that he brought a doctor's perspective to the revolution. And while um, it's one thing if you're a businessman or a lawyer and you think you will pass laws that'll fix problems, uh, Rush's perspective was very much that of a doctor where uh, he believed he would not be surprised that we are having fights about race and fights about free, uh, separation of church and state Today, he believed that these issues were hardwired in America, and they would always be part of us finding a more perfect union. Um, so as a physician, I think he had a better, a more realistic perspective on all these things, which is part of the reason why his writing seems so modern today. If you're interested in learning more about Rush besides reading the book, which I, of course, recommend, uh, we've started building a Rush portal, which we're hoping if we get more funding will become a Rush Papers project uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and the library company. Um, this is the address for it, and it actually has links to everything that Rush wrote that's been digitized so you can read it. And uh, Rush's lecture notes are now being digitized by the University of Pennsylvania, both his handwritten notes and the notes of his students, um, which are actually quite fascinating. Uh, I'm going to stop here and take questions, but if you are interested in getting in touch with me, learning more about Benjamin Rush, uh, here are some ways you can find me. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention, and I will turn things back over to Joel and we'll have um, some conversation. Terrific. Thanks, so much. that was a wonderful um, talk. That was really great. I don't see any questions yet, so that I guess gives me the opportunity to ask questions. Okay. Um, one, so I, I mean, I have a whole bunch of questions actually. Um, one thought kind of near the end of your lecture, I was thinking about, you know, I mean, what's really been gratifying in the last, I would say, you know, decade or a little less, five years or so, I've seen, you know, I mean, psychiatry residents in particular have been really um, um, much more socially engaged um, and seeing their role as psychiatrists is kind of, you know, is part being, you know, looking at inequality, look, you know, thinking about how racism is shaping what we do as psychiatrists. And I was thinking, you know, um, to what extent do you think um, Rush as an abolitionist um, shaped his views of psychiatry as a, you know, have shaped how we saw psychiatric illness, perhaps, um, or is there any connection whatsoever? Is it reading too well, much? Well, I think a couple ways. One, you know, Rush believed that psychiatric illnesses should be treated equally for all other illnesses. So 
this language that we think of as so contemporary and part of our advocacy of the late 20th and early 21st century of, you know, the brain being part of the body and uh, just we want that kind of equality. Rush wrote about that as if it was taken for granted back then. And it was hard to convince people of that then too. Rush understood that racial inequalities that he saw in America needed to be addressed. Um, part of it was simply that he treated patients of all different races, but also he was upset by racism. And as much as he was upset by slavery, he knew that slavery wasn't going to get solved in his lifetime because Alexander Hamilton made a deal um, that was going to prevent that from happening. Mm. So his main goal was to make sure that free blacks in the country, one, remained free, and two, that he addressed why people were prejudiced against them because he believed firmly the only thing different about them was their skin color. Mm -hmm. And this made him very controversial. I mean, <clears throat> I remember reading in the newspaper one time, somebody saying, well, can you believe last night, Benjamin Rush at the Philosophical Society suggested that white people and black people were created by the same God. I mean, this is in the newspaper. Uh, so Rush was also, he was really interesting guy because he was, he was pretty confrontational. He wanted to know what people believed. So there's many conversations. He wanted to know what people's religious beliefs were. Um, he lived in a world, uh, and, and it came partly from his training. I mean, Rush was a Christian who was, and many of his heroes like William Cullen and Benjamin Franklin were deists. So he had to deal with the reality of being a religious man met who many of his heroes were not religious and thought religion was kind of dangerous. <clears throat> so his ideas about toleration and about equality uh, were very well earned in his life. And so they were hardwired into his writing and hardwired into his politics. And I think that he was a little surprised why other people didn't take those. They weren't so obvious to people. Um, I mean, he was amazed when Bishop White, for example, was against him helping African-Americans build their own church because he was offended that it suggested that the Church of England or the Episcopal Church was racist. And he's saying, no, they want to have their own church. You're making them sit in the back. You're making them sit in the, you know, in the, in the balcony. They want to have their own church. Let's help them have their own church. So, and what's nice about it also, Rush's writing is very easy to read. You know, he wrote like a magazine writer. There were no highfalutin medical journals at that time. Um, and I would say for a historian, his handwriting is also easy to read. Um, <laughs> so some people, uh, you know, it's pretty hard to read their actual handwriting, but Rush's handwriting is good. But I think that what's really powerful about it and the reason it resonates with me today is that he just took for granted that the reason that we fought the war of the Revolutionary War was so there would be freedom. Mm -hmm. And that there will be equality. And that was not going to be a quality that was just run by the people who had money or just run by the people who had the dominant religion or the dominant race. That, that the American experiment was really trying to figure out how everybody could be equal. And he was constantly concerned about that. Some of the things that he did may have been in history may have looked look bad. Um, he, I mean, he wrote a paper once asking why black people were black. Um, because it was the only thing that was different about them than being white. And he said, well, maybe it's from a medical condition in their genetic past, um, if, in which case maybe people would, would forgive them for being black and stop being prejudiced against them. So the only medical condition he could think of that causes skin color to get dark was leprosy. And for some reason, it didn't occur to him that somebody might be outraged by the idea that he was suggesting that black people were black because they had leprosy in their past. But if you actually read the paper, in many ways, it's, it's actually quite high-minded. There was a right piece about it in Lancet not that long ago, uh, which basically referred to it as the most, as sort of the weirdest attempt to sort of prove that all men are brothers uh, that you could possibly think of. So some of the things, you know, aren't, aren't perfect, but Rush really struggled with this stuff and wrote about it. I, I think it's also an important lesson for how, um, you know, kind of social and structural forces shape how we see science too, that, you know, that even, you know, I mean, in, in part of what you're saying, it sounds like is that some of the ways in which Russia's science shaped how we saw the world was shaped by, you know, a lot of, you know, very racist ways of seeing the world, which are part of his contemporary, you know, period of time. I mean, yeah, there are other positive sides to it too, but in this case, it gives a good example of the ways in which kind of cultural values are infused get infused into science and into scientific explanations. There's some, yes. let me move on to some, um, there's some, a whole bunch of questions that people have and I don't want to great. end up monopolizing the conversation, which I easily could, because it was such a great talk. Um, so here's a question um, from Diana Lee Lux, 
Luxembourg did Rush study or treat mental illness in children? Did he also write on these children and techniques that were useful? It's really interesting. And that question came up in a talk I gave the other day. Um, it's not a dominant thing in his writing. And the person who asked me the day made me want to go back and look at it. There were very few, if any, children in the uh, uh, inpatient facility at Pennsylvania Hospital. And um, I think that uh, he... Uh, he, he talked to people about his ideas in terms of behavior. I'm not sure that they were, I mean, keep in mind that this is a time when it was very difficult to separate seizure disorder from developmental disability from psychiatric disorder. And all these people eventually ended up at Pennsylvania Hospital because people didn't know how to treat them. And uh, he did his best to sort of try to uh, figure them out. Although, you know, one of the people that we have the best uh, study on is his son, because his son had what appeared to be behavioral problems his whole life. And we actually have like letters that uh, he wrote to his son to try to get him to behave differently. He obviously had anger issues, the one who became mentally ill. Um, we actually have a letter that he and Julia wrote to him when he was about to go overseas um, and explaining to him, you know, like how he should act around people. And uh, he got involved in fights defending his father. So when he finally had his psychotic break, I don't know if Rush put it together, but a psychiatrist today would say, okay, here's a kid who was having issues with his family that they didn't see as medical until later. And then they really saw them as medical. Mm -hmm. But I, the one thing I will say is that a lot of Rush's medical writing has not been digitized. And I will tell you that most of it has been digitized by people with very specific research goals. So it has the, 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 this huge pile of information that is in a various um, facilities in Philadelphia has not been queried for a lot of really important medical and social issues yeah. uh, because Rush, Part of the reason people know about Rush up until very recently is that he's quoted in all the John Adams biographies because all the good quotes about John Adams are for Benjamin Rush. So he was basically seen as a way to get to more important founders. Yeah. Now that we're taking him seriously as a founder, I believe that people will ask these kinds of questions of the material and they will find lots of inferences about them. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, even the idea that children had some psychiatric illnesses is a pretty 20th century idea. Um, yeah. But he certainly had ideas because there were, you know, many developmentally disabled children. And um, there were even people in that unit who had been living on the street. So, there, you know, the idea that we have that this sort of homeless mental ill is a new thing. I mean, there were homeless people who were identified as homeless people who then ended up in Russia's um, mm -hmm. uh, facility. And, um, and you can see them. And, and, and they did interviews with them because they started doing clinical interviews, the first talk therapy. And some of those were written down and we have them. Great. I, I, I have a, here's a um, question from um, Greg Gabrales, which is actually a question I was kind of pondering, I think. Um, it's a little long, but I'll try to read it quickly um, because it's an interesting question. Um, so he writes, it sounds like Rush was very involved in politics and was an enlightenment think thinker disdained um, conformism. But it's hard to name many American psychiatrists in public life in the 20th century, although there are a few um, that, um, um, let's see, though um, he was not an American, Franz Fanon um, was a, a leading example as, um, of a political psychiatrist, and his writings continue to inspire us. Um, his recently translated psychiatric writings have helped confirm his contribution to medicine as well as politics. Um, what are, and then he continues, what are some of the reasons that American psychiatrists may have shied away from participation in politics, even though many of the social and economic changes have, margin, um, have marginalized and become especially harmful for people with serious mental illness, uh, privatization of healthcare, high unemployment, social fragmentation. So, well, I, so yeah. I, have, I have two points of view on that. One comes from my writing about Rush. The other comes from my work teaching psychiatrists how to work for the general, write for the general public, which I've done on and off at Columbia for a number of years. Um, when it comes to Rush, I mean, Rush was a seminal figure in American history. There was never a doctor who was so involved in the political process. It's not even a question of being a surgeon general. I mean, first of all, there's only one signing of the Declaration of Independence, while the, several doctors signed the Declaration, none as important as Rush. And Rush believed, to, he wanted to be a public intellectual who was a doctor. And not only did he come from the world of the Scottish Enlightenment, but he believed that there was an American Enlightenment that would be a more democratic version of what he had learned about 
in the Scottish Enlightenment, and he took that really seriously. Um, and so uh, I think that for a long time, Rush was the person who wrote that way. His writings outlived him for a really long time. And, uh, but the other part of it is that Rush wrote for the public. He, he, wrote, he was an explanatory writer trying to explain to the general public basic ideas. And even though he only edited Common Sense, the idea of common sense was to explain the idea of independence to people who don't get it. And I will tell you that very few psychiatrists who write for the general public and write about political things actually write for anybody but themselves and their colleagues. Yeah. Okay. So they are not trying hard enough, in my opinion, to actually change the way the world works or the way the world views things. Mm -hmm. They are more writing about how in incredulous they are that the world is this way and that people don't listen to what psychiatrists know that would fix it. And I think that there are generations of generations of that. Some of the writing is interesting, but in order to be a public writer, any kind of medical public writer, I think you have to ask yourself, am I actually writing for the public? And uh, am I writing something that the public can uh, join in the conversation and realize that there's no perfect answer? I think the other thing that I have found in a lot of physicians' writings is that they're not interested in the debate over the answers. They're interested in writing something that will convince somebody that their perspective is right. And, and, and that's the way medical journals work. I mean, medical journals are set up so you put forth an idea, you defend it, you throw it out there. But, but like when I write about those journals in, a, in, in the general public, I try to write about the battle of ideas, one, how it works intellectually, and two, how it works on the ground for patients who are caught in the middle of, you know, you know, of CBT versus, you know, different things, you know, these debates have real world ramifications for patients who just want to decide, should I get psychotherapy or should I take meds or should I take them both? You know? And so a lot of times when you read Rush's writing, it's, it's very practical at that level. So, you know, when he writes about medicine for, uh, uh, for, for army men, He's writing about things like he invented the, uh, the crew cut for, uh, for people in the army because he explained that if your hair was shorter, you're less likely to get lice and it's less likely to freeze when it's wet. He also gave advice like, don't go to the bathroom so close to your tent. So he wasn't afraid of writing in a more public way. And so I do think that part of the challenge for every generation of docs and every generation of, uh, especially of mental health professionals, is how do we deal with the unbelievable divisiveness in our field Right? How do we write about the competing ideas in a way that doesn't make that doesn't seem to undermine them? And I think Rush was really good at, at, at not being afraid to write about those things and not because he believed that America was, I think, at, at its essence, he believed that America was always going to be about these fights, that these fights weren't bad. They were America, they were democracy. And so he didn't shy away from them. But I do agree with the questioner that there's never been a, a medical writer as powerful in the society as Benjamin Rush was during his time. It's really hard to imagine, you know, when Rush died, it was considered as big a deal as when Benjamin Franklin died or when George Washington died. I mean, Rush was a very big deal um, as a politician, but also as a doctor. I mean, people from all over the country wrote Rush letters and put like a dollar in them asking him for medical advice because he was, he was also just a famous doctor. I think I, I can understand why Peter invited you to come. I, and I, I hate to bring it back to the residents again, but I could imagine it would be great for you to get, I, I, a lot of our residents have been writing editorials, have been you know, really engaged in what's going on now, especially around issues of inequality and race and how that shapes um, our psychiatric practices and how our psychiatric care often embodies the structural forces that um, have led to a lot of inequality, especially in Los Angeles, but elsewhere in the country. And so yes. I could, I think it would be great something, uh, maybe I hate to put you on the spot, but it would be wonderful that if we could bring you back for the residents even to teach us how to write as more, uh, you know, at least consider being more public intellectuals and, and seeing how our, you know, our kind of knowledge, knowledge can actually be, go beyond just the circle of our, you know, kind of professional um, interest, but to actually have an effect, um, a larger effect. I'm very, I'm very interested in that. Yeah. You know, you have my email address. That's great. Well, um, I want to thank you so much. It was really, um, you know, a terrific talk on, you know, who I think is a psych, I mean, I, again, uh, you know, as a psychiatrist, 
who's also a historian, but thought, Benjamin Rush, what is he really going to tell us about contemporary, the contemporary world? And do we, you know, and it turns out there's a lot he has to tell us. And it, it's an important topic that I'm really glad that uh, you gave us um, more insight both into him and, and gave us thoughts about, you know, uh, the, our present predicament that we're in as well. So. Well, thank you. And, and if you're, if the viewers here want to reach out to me, they can find me at my website at stephenfried.com. Um, if you want to give them my email address, please do. Uh, if they want to access the Rush portal, uh, maybe we'll email around so they can get that address uh, for it as well. Uh, but I'm very in much engaged and trying to engage uh, physicians of all sort in this story. And, and of course, I hope you read the book and find the book interesting. Yeah, great. Um, I guess we just leave. I, again, since I'm new <laughs> at this, I, I, I guess we say goodbye. And, and we have grand rounds, I think, for next week as well. And I don't know who it is. Um, take care. And I'll email you. I'll definitely be in touch with you. Thank you very much.